Hello everybody, I'm Bob Abbey, Adult Services Librarian for the City of Forest Grove. Welcome to another segment in our summer-long Festival of Forgotten Authors. Today, I want to look at a writer who battled alcoholism, substance abuse, and mental illness to produce a handful of works that documented the lives of everyday individuals in the Third Reich, and whose decision to stay in Germany during the Nazi years tarnished his reputation for decades after the war. Coming up, this week's forgotten author, Hans Falada. Hans Falada was born Rudolf Wilhelm Friedrich Ditzen in Greifswald, Germany in 1893. I want to say a couple of things about his name. First, the pseudonym he adopted in 1920 derives from a pair of Grimm's fairy tales, the title character in Hans in Luck and Falada, the magical talking horse, in The Goose Girl. For the sake of consistency, I'll use Ditson when I talk about his early years prior to that name change. The second is the pronunciation. Sometimes you'll hear Falada, other times Falada. I've chosen the former, Falada, because it's what I've heard most often and because the Germans tend to place the emphasis on the first syllable of a multisyllable name. In 1911, at the age of 18, Rudolf Ditzen was involved in a suicide pact with his friend Hans Dietrich von Necker, an event the literary scholar Jeff Wilkes suggests may have been tied to an attempt to come to terms with a growing mutual sexual attraction. Von Necker fired his gun and missed. Ditzen's bullet, however, hit its mark. Ditson then took von Necker's gun and shot himself in the chest, but he survived and was charged with his friend's murder. Having been declared unfit to stand trial, Ditson was confined to a mental institute, and upon his release in 1913, spent the next several years working in a variety of jobs in the field of agriculture. It was around this time that Ditson relocated briefly to Berlin, where he developed a weakness for alcohol and morphine that would incapacitate him for the rest of his life. Ditson had expressed an interest in writing as a young boy, and he continued to cultivate this throughout his early adult years. When his debut novel was published in 1920, his father, a retired judge, urged him to change his name to distance himself from any associations with the von Necker scandal, and so Rudolf Ditson became Hans Falada. A second novel followed in 1923, but like its predecessor, the book sold poorly. Meanwhile, Falada's dependency on morphine increased. To pay for the mounting cost of his addiction, he resorted to stealing from his employers. Convicted twice of embezzlement, he spent a total of two and a half years in prison. When he was finally released in 1928, Falada journeyed to Hamburg and started attending meetings at a local temperance organization. He also held a variety of odd jobs to make ends meet, including working as a reporter for a newspaper in the small town of Neumünster. He married Anna Issel, a young woman of working class background he met in Hamburg, and the two decided to start a family. In 1929, Ernst Rowvolt, who had published Falada's first two books, offered him part-time clerical work in his Berlin office. Falada and his wife, who was expecting their first child, moved back to the capital just as the effects of the Great Depression were beginning to undermine the German economy. When Rowvolt's publishing house was placed into receivership, Falada went months without a paycheck but he continued to write, and before long, he had produced two major social novels which Rovolt decided to publish. The first, Farmers, Functionaries, and Fireworks, which came out in 1931, drew on events that Falada had witnessed while working at the newspaper in Neumünster, and earned praise from such literary figures as Hermann Hesse and Robert Musil. But with the publication of Little Man, What Now? in 1932, Falada finally began to attract attention as a writer of note. As he quickly learned, though, attention in Germany during the 1930s produced its own set of headaches. 
Little Man What Now tells the story of Hans Penneberg, the little man referred to in the title, his wife, Emma, and their young son, who's nicknamed the Shrimp, who struggle to make ends meet during the Depression. Poverty and hardship are constant companions for the Pennebergs, as are the large social and economic forces which govern their lives and which prove to be almost insurmountable obstacles for them to overcome. Falada depicts their ongoing financial difficulties as well as Penneberg's unemployment in clear, simple, and direct prose. But it was the author's emphasis on the role of the family in overcoming adversity that apparently struck a chord with readers. Little Man, What Now? became an instant bestseller in Germany, with 48,000 copies going into circulation by the end of 1932. Thomas Mann called it painfully true to life. Graham Greene praised it for its superb characters. And the English writer Beryl Bainbridge commended it as an inspired work of a great writer hitherto neglected in the English-speaking world. The novel was serialized in newspapers all around the country, translated into several languages, and turned into a motion picture. In the United States, Little Man What Now was the Book of the Month Club selection for June 1933, and it was adapted for Hollywood with Douglas Montgomery and Margaret Sullivan in the starring roles. The novel made Falada a celebrity, and provided him with a sizable income. It might be helpful at this point to step back a bit and provide some historical context. In January 1933, Adolf Hitler's long rise to power culminated in his appointment as Chancellor of Germany and the passage of the Enabling Act, which granted him virtually unlimited power. By March of 1933, the Ministry of Public Enlightenment and Propaganda had been established under Joseph Goebbels, the purpose of which was to assume full control of the press and all means of social communication, such as newspapers, magazines, films, books, public meetings and ceremonies, and foreign press relations, as well as theater, art, music, radio, and television. The Nazis implemented a strict policy of what was called coordination, which ensured that every aspect of the lives of German citizens was permeated with the party's ideas and prejudices. They systematically eliminated or co-opted non-Nazi organizations that could potentially influence people, and they suppressed, intimidated, or murdered anyone deemed to be critical of Hitler or the Nazis. Those with the means to leave Germany often did so, but Falada, like many other Germans, failed to take the new regime seriously, and so he decided to stay. He bought a house on the outskirts of Berlin where he had hoped to escape attention, but after the home's previous owner denounced him as an anti-Nazi conspirator to regain possession of the property, Falada was jailed briefly. He also began to attract scrutiny because he had not yet joined the Nazi party. In 1934, Goebbels' Ministry of Propaganda recommended that Little Man What Now be withdrawn from German libraries. And the following year, Falada was officially listed as an undesirable author, effectively closing off his works from being translated or published abroad. From the summer of 1936 to the spring of 1937, Falada worked on Wolf Among Wolves, a sprawling epic depiction of German society as it disintegrated in the early 1920s. Set against the backdrop of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles, Wolf Among Wolves is the story of Wolfgang Pagel, known as Wolf to his friends, the son of a successful middle-class artist who also suffers from a gambling addiction and whose lover, Petra, is arrested and taken to jail. The two of them escape Berlin to the countryside where they come across a band of German soldiers who've taken refuge while they wait to stage an insurrection. Despite its length at over 800 pages and large cast of characters, the novel always moves forward. Falada notices everything, but he's also a judicious documentarian, offering just enough detail to flesh out a scene, but not so much that the action bogs down. Falada commented that he wrote Wolf Among Wolves without looking up, 
nor did I look round either, neither to the left nor to the right. Given everything that was happening at the time, the enactment of the so-called Nuremberg Laws that deprived Jews of their citizenship, the opening of the first concentration camps, and the remilitarization of the Rhineland, it's hard to imagine how Falada, or any writer for that matter, could have focused on something so intently and with such singularity of purpose. During the 1940s, Falada, having chosen to remain in Germany because he could not imagine writing in another language or living in another country, continued out of necessity to produce harmless books of fairy tales and stories for children, as well as two volumes of occasionally revealing memoirs. The second of these, a sunny and often comical depiction of life on his farm, brought him back into favor again briefly with the Nazis, who always liked upbeat narratives with rural settings. But Falada's personal life began to come apart at the seams. His farmhouse, which had served for so long as a sort of refuge from personal turmoil and the horrors of the outside world, soon became overrun with refugees and relatives fleeing Allied bombing attacks, making it difficult for him to concentrate on writing. He also suffered long periods of debilitating depression, and he drank too much. Repeated breakdowns necessitated additional treatment and recuperation at sanatoriums and clinics. A series of barely concealed adulterous affairs undermined his already failing marriage, which ended in divorce in the summer of 1944. Shortly thereafter, a very drunk Falada threatened his ex-wife with a gun and was ordered to spend two and a half months in a Nazi psychiatric prison. Falada had managed several times throughout his career to deflect a request from Joseph Goebbels to write an anti-Semitic novel based on a famous fraud case involving two Jewish financiers in the 1920s, a project that had tremendous potential as a propaganda tool for the Nazis. During this most recent period of incarceration, Falada used this project as a ruse to gain access to writing materials, telling his guards that he was working on something important for the ministry. He filled page after page with small overlapping writing that actually contained several different texts, including a handful of short stories, an account of his run-ins with the Nazis, and his autobiographical novel, The Drinker, which was not deciphered or published until three years after Falada's death. The Drinker is a story of a merchant who suffers from alcoholism and morphine addiction and who tries to kill himself after being sentenced to an asylum. By placing his own substance abuse at the center of a piece of fiction written in a totalitarian regime that regarded such behavior as grounds for physical abuse, sterilization, or death, Falada engaged in an open act of defiance. As the scholar Jeff Wilkes points out, Falada's relationship with the Nazi party was a very complex one, such that collaboration was not always prompt, coerced, or unconditional, and resistance was not always immediate, impassioned, or uncompromising. By early 1945, with the war grinding to a halt and the Nazis in retreat, Falada's fortunes again began to rise. Not long after the Soviets invaded the area around his farm in May of 1945, Falada was invited to serve as interim mayor during the processes of denazification, a post he had to relinquish after three and a half months as a result of a nervous breakdown that was complicated by morphine supplied to him by the wealthy young widow, herself an addict with whom he had recently married. While recovering in Berlin, Falada met Johannes Becker, a German author charged with reviving culture in the country after the war along strong anti-fascist lines. In addition to securing regular food and lodging for the author in the Soviet sector of Berlin, Becker also encouraged Falada to start writing again, and he introduced him to the story of Otto and Elise Hampel, a middle-aged working-class couple who embarked on a Nazi resistance campaign after Elise's brother was killed early in the war. From 1940 to 1942, 
the couple secretly distributed more than 200 handwritten postcards encouraging opposition to the Nazi regime. The Hoppels were tracked down by both the regular police and the Gestapo, who assumed they were dealing with a large network of resistance workers. The couple was convicted of treason and executed by beheading on April 8, 1943. Fala had read through some of the official documents in the Hampel case, and in October 1945, he signed a contract for a novel, which he proposed to deliver on January 1, 1946. Work on the book, which was titled Every Man Dies Alone, had to wait until September of 1946, as Fala spent most of the first half of that year undergoing treatment for substance abuse. Once he finally started in on the project, Falada wrote, in the words of his biographer, in a white heat, completing the final draft of what turned out to be his last novel in just 24 days. But its publication would be posthumous. Falada died in February 1947 at age 53 of the cumulative damage that his often self-destructive lifestyle had inflicted on his body. As he had done in his earlier novels, Falada focuses in Every Man Dies Alone on the actions of a couple, Otto and Anna Krongel, who become disillusioned with the regime when their only son is killed in action early in the war, prompting them to distribute anti-Nazi propaganda throughout buildings all around Berlin. The Gestapo launches an investigation that costs an innocent man his life and results in the humiliation and suicide of a veteran police detective. Otto and Anna are eventually caught and executed, as are several others who are inadvertently implicated during the course of the Gestapo's interrogation. Every Man Dies Alone is an agonizing story that depicts in a very matter-of-fact way how totalitarian societies deform personal relationships and isolate individuals from meaningful contact with family and friends. And it documents the atmosphere of fear, harassment, and suspicion that dominated life during the final apocalyptic years of the Third Reich. Every Man Dies Alone is now recognized as one of the most important fictionalized accounts of life under a totalitarian regime. And the Italian writer Primo Levi called it the greatest book ever written about German resistance to the Nazis. Despite the critical acclaim it now has, the novel was largely forgotten in the late 1940s and 1950s, especially in Germany, where the emphasis was on looking forward rather than on looking back. Even though, the, even though the novel finally found a slightly larger audience in the 1960s and 1970s, it wasn't available in English until 2009. Followed as other books, four of which have been translated and are now available through outstanding editions issued by Melville House, still await discovery. So what are we to make of Hans Falada? Given that many of his German contemporaries who chose exile considered it unethical or immoral for anyone with a conscience to remain in the country, Falada's decision to stay put, keep as low a profile as possible, and wait for the regime to collapse certainly placed him and other so-called inner immigrants in a difficult position. Thomas Mann, who lived abroad during the Hitler years, viewed writers like Falada with contempt. It may be a superstitious belief, he wrote later, but in my eyes, any books which could be printed at all in Germany between 1933 and 1945 are worse than worthless and not objects one wishes to touch. A stench of blood and shame attaches to them. They should all be pulped. There can be little doubt that Falada's actions during the Third Reich have tainted his reputation. Because he never became a party member, he was not accepted into the circle of writers who enjoyed the full and unconditional backing of the regime. His awareness that Nazi party officials looked with disfavor at his books and might prevent him at any moment from writing or being published kept him in a constant state of anxiety about losing the livelihood he had come to depend on both materially and physically. The best of his novels, including Little Man What Now, 
Wolf Among Wolves, and most importantly, Every Man Dies Alone, offer revealing portraits of a dark period in German history written by an attentive observer. Falada is one of the few German writers of the time to have produced such a rich and detailed glimpse into the lives, attitudes, behaviors, and modes of expression of a group of individuals who might otherwise have escaped our gaze. I hope you've enjoyed this brief introduction to the life and works of Hans Falada, and will join me again next week for another segment in our Festival of Forgotten Authors. Until then, I'm Bob Abbey. Keep reading.